All right, everybody, welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show, uh, where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. We're your hosts, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. We are excited today. We've got a special guest on from Boston. We got uh, Nick Ellerud here. Hi, Nick. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're glad glad to have somebody up here in the in the Northeast with us. Pretty cool. So we want to dive in. I think we have kind of some similar businesses, and um, you know, you're a real estate investor. And I we want to hear kind of about your journey and that kind of stuff, and we can so hopefully help inspire our listeners. You know, every time we we talk to people, we find that there's people that have success, and I think people look at that success and they think, my God, I could never do it, or or you know, it's so it, it, things come so easy for other people. And I know you're rolling your eyes, right? Same thing as me. We all, anybody who's been successful, we all look at each other. We we have an understanding because we don't even know each other's stories, but I guarantee you they're similar. Yeah, or people, or people sometimes think, you know, they see where you are now, but they forget the journey that it took to get there, and that you know it all started with one. It's like, oh my goodness, now you have all these rental properties, and you've done this many flips, and blah 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 blah. That just like seems overwhelming for them. And we always tell our students, you know, yeah, but it started with one. <laughs> Yeah. So, so Nick, That's tell it. us tell us all about where you are now, and then I want to dive back to kind of how you got started. So, what tell, you're in Boston, and tell us what you kind of do, what you specialize in. Today, we have a uh, wholesale business and a fix and flip business. Been doing that for about 15 years. Uh, we have um, a re rental portfolio similar to yourselves. Uh, we've been kind of picking and choosing on that since uh, 2009. Uh, I'll probably chat about, uh, you know, my credit challenges in 05. We'll talk about that probably in a bit. But um, then I, we also went, morphed into a short sale or debt negotiation business. My partner, Marianne, and the team runs that since 2010. And we also have a property management company and a real estate brokerage in the greater Boston area. So kind of all. Tell the listeners, you know, we use that lingo all the time in our world, but not everybody may know what a wholesale is. Let's Let's have a wholesale, your definition of it. Sure. Sure. Yes. Wholesaling. Um, but it's, it's the biggest, we I talk about a ladder, right? So the, we talk about active to passive income investment ladder. So active is the one where if you don't necessarily have a lot of credit or cash, but you have time and you have the drive to hustle um, at the bottom of the chain, which is where I restarted, uh, you, you know, you're knocking on doors, you're making phone calls, you're texting, you're, you're, you're working on finding a deal for a rehabber or a landlord to then purchase from you and flip either the paper like the contract or doing a back-to-back -back closing where you're making the spread in the middle, whether it's a five grand assignment fee, 10 grand assignment fee, 20K back-to-back -back closing or 50K back-to-back -back closing. That's a wholesale. You get a spread and the, there's still money left in there for the end investor. Yep. And then you mentioned short sales too. Just tell a listener about short sales just so they know in case someone says, what's a short sale? So Sure. Yep. Uh, short sales in 2009, especially is when me and my partner Marianne started, there was an awful lot of underwater houses, meaning that the yeah. sellers owed a lot more on their house than the houses were worth and we could pay for them. And that's not just the first mortgage, that's first mortgage, second mortgage, executions, judgments, mechanics liens, like credit cards. It's like everything added up. If you if your offer is less than all of that, one of those creditors is going to have to be sold short and you need a negotiator uh, to, to help push that through the uh, the lenders and the creditors on that. Great explanation. What do you, it is? What do you think that your um, kind of your core business is? Like, what's your core business that you do? Because you do several businesses, like we do. What's kind of your core business? What's the one you wake up and get really excited about? <laughs> right, it's it's always been the fix and flip. I mean, I love the fix and flip business a lot. Um, you know, whole it, that's taking something that's totally ugly and making it beautiful and seeing the look on a you know a buyer's face is still awesome. Recently, though, you know, my my new passion has been. Um, uh, my why has changed, right? So now kids, but then even with kids, I never even learned to actually scale until maybe like three or four years ago uh, after, you know, 12 years in the business. But now uh, literally seeing my team succeed is a big part of that. And I've been also focused more on the commercial development side. Uh, so while my team has been kind of taking over the fix and flip, but I still love the fix and flip. I still love the um, looking at the finished product and seeing that emotional, you know, look on the set, on the buyer's face. Amber always, Amber always says, she says, I, I like, you know, taking something ugly and making it beautiful. I always say, that's why she married me. I'm a work in progress. So that's a, that's a, we haven't quite gotten there yet with me. But, yeah, I'm getting pretty, yeah, I got a lot of forehead going on. So I know, I know how that all goes. So where, where did it start for you, Nick? Yeah. Uh, where did it start? Your background's in politics, right? I was a political science major, indeed. Oh my God, here we go. All right, not in this climate. <laughs> yeah, but go ahead, tell us about your background. 
Well, only because you brought up the politics side. I, I literally was going to be an attorney or a politician until I graduated college, right? And my mom bought me a bumper sticker, and it actually said – like it was, it was a gift, but it was like a joke. She's like, politicians and diapers must be changed often and for the same reason. And yeah, yeah. It was a joke, but I looked at it, and, I'm, and I was a big people pleaser, huge people pleaser. And I'm like, oh, man, she's right. No one likes attorneys or politicians. This is terrible. Oh. Oh, I, mean, I know so, you, you want you grew up saying I want to do that like that's that was a choice. Or, like, well, <laughs> well, I mean, I think probably the ideology though is if you're a people pleaser, people pleaser, you go into that thinking that you can make change if you're in this position yeah. and that you can do good things. But then you know, there you yeah. go. Yeah. And before, before even realizing that, that's like the worst position to be in to try to please everybody, right? Like before you even realize that, <laughs> right? But you can't. <laughs> or even make but, positive changes. <laughs> yeah. Um, instead of that, I decided I went into banking and finance. So I was okay. worked at Mellon Bank in Boston for a while, and it was a great opportunity. Um, was promoted four or five times, but still was making under fifty thousand a year. And I remember just—I mean, it was a grind. I mean, it were sixty, seventy-hour work weeks. Um, I was like going to a chiropractor because I was like sitting, you know, stressed out all the time. I had the the biggest clients known as Fidelity Investments on my plate, mm -hmm. and um, I just—I mean, I remember working Christmas Day, New Year. Year's Day, and uh, I, I didn't really see a way out until, you know, one night I was playing a board game. I was losing the board game. Does, that doesn't matter. It's all side conversation. But I turned on late night infomercials, and I saw John Beck's tax lien free and clear system. You guys know John Beck? Have you dealt with him I, yet? That's not one I know of. No, I, I, I didn't know who you were going to say. I've heard seen many of them, but I haven't seen that one, no. Yeah, I think he went to jail, but he's back out now. So it's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's why I didn't see him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the information was actually pretty solid. It was, it was a fifty dollar thing on the infomercial. I bought it. I it, it arrived in a binder. It's you know how to buy real estate pennies on the dollar. So I'm reading through it, and I'm like, this kind of makes some sense. Okay, I can see I can you know make a good side hustle doing this. Then at the bottom it said, if you're serious about real estate, call this eight hundred number. I'm like, Guess I'm serious. I paid fifty bucks, and here came my uh, you know this binder. So best salesman in the entire world talked me into my first coaching boot camp of six thousand dollars. And I had three credit cards, and it was an over-the-phone coaching thing from North Carolina. I didn't know yeah. who this guy was. Um, and I, that specific coaching, I didn't get a lot out of it. Of course, now, between the three of us, I'm sure we have you know hundreds of thousands of dollars into coaching. But oh, yeah. That specific one was uh, he got me to read the Rich Dad Poor Dad book, right? And there we are. Like, changed my whole opinions, changed my whole view. And I knew at that moment that real estate was my way out. So I went to the Learning Annex in Boston, and I started. I bought all sorts of other programs. Um, did not execute for like about a year and a half, and then brought me nuts. But if you want to hear that story, I'll tell you that at some point. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, as you're saying that though, I'm looking at the background of your room there, and there's a little piece of paper clipped to your board there that says "Shut up and do it." And <laughs> that's that's the difference though, is the people that like buy that stuff and then they think I didn't get a lot of value out of it or whatever because they never take action. And that's what we always tell people too: is that you got to take action. You you know, you can't just like talk the talk you got to walk the walk do it what was your what was your first deal like what kind of deal and what was that first deal you ever did we've all we all remember that we've done i'm sure you've done hundreds of deals we've done hundreds of deals after a while you kind of forget them but you do remember some right and that well, I, remember, first, I remember the first five and i, and I, oh, I heard yeah. a book about it so i'm happy to share with you. <laughs> yeah yeah please yeah. yeah please do um so uh i mean amber you just you totally nailed it so that was for me i mean that that whole tagline since 2005 has been for me for me to stop my own mind right i was mad at myself because i had now invested 15 20 grand in these courses and these seminars and i hadn't done anything and i'm still working at the bank and i i had a uh people here around here laugh because they know i store my shampoo bottle i had hair back then i was kind of like you but <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I didn't know, like I, I was in the shower every day and I remember looking at the shampoo bottle and it kept going smaller and smaller. And I said, ah, by the time this is empty, I have to do a deal. I'm already like 20 grand. Like, I'm, come on, like shut up and do it. Like focus, focus, focus. And I'm out there hustling and, uh, on like, you know, the online forums at the time, they're different than they are now. And a guy in Minnesota saw me hustling on the forums and he said, Hey, listen, you're, you're know, trying to get into these deals. And I've got, this is 2005, mind you. Now I, I I knew nothing of real estate cycles either or market cycles. You know, I'm a new kid, fresh out of a, with a poli sci degree. I have nothing to do with this, right? Yeah. And he's like, I, I'm finding these undervalued pieces of real estate. 
Um, you, we can buy them at you know, 70% of market value. I'm lining up tenant buyers. Now, I don't know what a tenant buyer was or a rent to own was or a lease option was. I didn't know any of that. We're lining up these renters that are going to pay 20% above market rent to stay in these properties for three years. And they're going to sign a PNS to cash us out 20% above what we're paying for it. And the third kicker, which was the, the, my seller, the selling point, it was legal back then to contract, let's say, for a house at $450,000. And because it was 2005, we could finance that 90 to 100% finance. And the seller at the closing table could send us back a check for 50 grand saying, hey, thanks. Good luck. And that was legal back then, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, I'm going to buy, I'm not going to close on one of these things. I, my, my shampoo bottle is like this. I'm going to close on five in one week, get all my money back from these purchase closings that I've spent on these seminars and coachings. And um, this guy's going to teach me about rent to owns. He's going to teach me about how to manage property. Like this is awesome. And I close on five in one week. Uh, wow. there, were, there were 10 loans. Some of them were 80, 20, some of them were 90% down, and, you know, and uh, we had our first call with him. He had a buddy of mine here, but uh, a few too. We had our first call with our partner on Monday. And he didn't show up to that call. And then we had, uh, you know, we followed up with like a couple of phone calls and texts like, dude, where are you? And, he, you know, Thursday came, we had another call set up and he didn't show up to that call. All right, so wait, so make sure the listeners understand. So you were putting deals under contract. You said <laughs> P&S before, purchase and sale agreement. Is that, is that what you P&S, is that what you call it? Yes. So just so yes. they don't, people know what you are. And then you, you would refinance those 80, 90% value, take it out. That's how you got, that's how you got paid on the deal. That's a, that's one of the ways you got paid. Is that right? Or he would do that. <laughs> It's not a refund like it is now. Like back then, literally at a purchase closing, like we would pay a seller 450, right? And then literally at the closing table, he wouldn't take the 450. He just wanted 400, and he Got would slip us a 50 grand back. But it was financed by my lender. Got you it. Know? But you, but you, but you can't. But that can't be done anymore. Just so everybody's clear on that, that can't be yeah. done anymore, right? So that was all. That was back then. So you were doing that. So now you had a partner, and you're doing this, and now you're calling your partner, and he's not calling you back. He's not showing up to calls. All right, so not continue. <laughs> Turns out uh, the PNS agreements and the real applications, all that stuff that he showed us wasn't real. It was all forged. So he took 40% of that purchase money, which is what our agreement was, 60-40 split, and he went off into the wind. So I spent my version of that purchase money that I just made all, made all this money, which wasn't even mine, right? It was debt. But I, you know, trying to chase him, property managers trying to manage these things, and bottom line, 10 to 12 months later, I can only afford to pay 10 mortgage payments a month for eight months. And I lost all five houses, four to short sale, one to foreclosure. That's how I started in real estate. And ask me my next reset button. No, I'm just kidding. So, so, so let me ask you a question. So this is back 2005, six, seven, where, 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 where are we at? Oh, five. How does that make you feel? So you literally have just lost you, your, so your dream it's starting to come true, which I've never heard anybody measure or give themselves a deadline per a shampoo bottle. Very interesting, especially a guy with no hair. You that's know, always I, interesting. I, I say something. Sorry, man, but it's just saying, you know. I want to say something about that, though, because that's a key point, because there's so many people that are afraid to take action. But if you give yourself a deadline, yeah. that's like really wicked cool. And that you use a shampoo bottle is even cooler. Well, but, when you see it every day, right? You're right. in the shower, so you see it going down. And that, that's an interesting way, because that's something you're going to see. You can't just brush it off. You're going right. to see that. And, and, and there's all different techniques that you can use. Mel Robbins even promotes the five, four, three, two, one. Like, you know, if you're afraid to do something, you know, you... You just count down in your head, five, four, three, two, one, and then you take action. So, you know, there's all different things. But the point is that you gave yourself a deadline. And, you know, yes, the end of the story wasn't um, what you wanted to happen. Well, at that point. At that point. At that but, point. But you still took action. So tell us what you felt during that time. Because I think, again, I started off by saying that people think that people that are successful just step into it. Oh, that guy, everything he touches, he's the Midas man. Everything he touches turns to gold. That's what they think <laughs> about people that are successful, even us. And and I even before we started, I. I know all of us have struggles and get we we get the shit knocked out of us. We really do. And I think we get knocked down hard. And I want to know what you felt like during that time. What does that feel like? So you're riding high. Did you actually take any money in on the initial deals or he your your the guy that scammed you? Um how'd that work? Did you make any money at all when you first started or no? I took the forty I took the sixty percent in, but I was that was pushed into escrow paying for all these holding costs, right? While we yeah. were waiting. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it pretty pretty hard and um so just pay all those payments you're paying all those payments so now you're trying to cash flow everything and you're short every month and then yes. you run out now how how that how that impact you how did it feel and how did it impact you it 100 agree so 
uh, I was afraid my phone and I tell this story sometimes my phone was ringing every 38 seconds with robo collection call dials yeah. to the point where I was I had a serious anxiety issue with my phone and I put it in a drawer and I said forget this you know and I I, I thank God I still had my job at the bank but if they check my credit now my credit was tanking right and not only was my credit tanking I, I didn't know what a short sale was back then either so I'm really like, there's a, there's, there's an investor, God bless this investor out in Minnesota, didn't know anything about short sales at the time. He came to my aid. He came and said, listen, I know these are stress for you. Your head's in the sand. Let me deal with this. Let me take on all these, the, the lender negotiation, all that, and they'll stop calling you. And that's all I wanted was a lender to stop calling me. Yeah. He uh, ran those deals, but I, and I, the bank approved short sales, but was just putting them in front of me. I was signing anything they put in front of me just to get rid of these things. I didn't know that I was signing about $400,000 in unsecured promissory notes. I should have read it, didn't read it, was just signing, just take it, please do whatever you gotta do, do whatever you gotta do. And um, as my head finally slowly came out of the sand, I realized that I, you know, number one, you know, was afraid of my phone, didn't want to turn it back on. Number two, I now have a credit score of maybe under 420. Uh, number three, all of my cash was gone. Now that my cash was gone, I'm starting in the hole $400,000. That's now on my credit report. Uh, and I, you know, I probably should have filed bankruptcy at the time, but I, at the time felt I had made a commitment and I wasn't the type to kind of go back on those commitments. So um, I uh, knew I had to work my way back. And th what I felt at the time, if you're going into the pit, which is what I call it, right? The pit there was, yeah. One of the darkest, uh, I've had four hard resets in my business. That was the first one. And the first one being the hardest, right? Because you think that you, you can never you can never come back from it. If I, and, could, if I could jump in and say this, Nick, that I know, you know, back, if those people who know my story, you know, I'm 51 now, but when I was, when I was uh, 21, so 30 years ago, I went bankrupt three times. I've had two foreclosures, lost. So it, we hadn't even discussed this before the call. So our first time you and I meeting and I knew We've all been beat up hard, and I remember personally feeling like, like helpless, like like there's just I didn't know I was so far in the hole I couldn't even see light and didn't even know what to do or what to turn. And and back when this happened to me in the 90s, cell phones I didn't really have a cell there were car phones back then, but my phone rang off the frigging hook, and they were calling my next door neighbors to come tell me that I had to take. I mean it was bad, right? Servers showing up, it, so I. Share with me how oh. you felt. I I felt hopeless. First, I felt hopeless. I felt like this is it. Like it's over. Like I don't even know what over meant. I just like I don't even know where to begin. And I wonder if you shared that same feeling during that time. Thousand percent. How can I run away from this? Right? How can I just get away? Like I I don't want to even exist right now. Where how can I start a new life? You know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah you and I went to it together, Glenn. Um, yeah. And that was that was real real hard. And you know coming with the pit right as deep and dark as that pit is uh i had i had paid for one more course and i never actually took it and it was a uh, you heard of marshall silver he's a vegas I've hypnotist of, i've not heard of that one either no nope. he was an entertainer and a vegas hypnotist and he was at one of these oh, real estate expos. yes i do now i know who you're talking about go ahead yes, continue yes so I, I had i had already paid for it uh and i'm like well whatever I'm paying for it. I'm taking it now. <laughs> yeah. And um, I had no idea what to even expect in that three day event. But that three day event, uh, you know, he had us laying on the floor doing some sort of you know hypnosis to us. And I didn't even necessarily believe in hypnosis. But I I, um, I remember, you know, he said, listen to your inner voice there. And I, I remember I'm talking to myself and while we're all laying on the floor listening to this music. And I, I remember like something in my head telling me what a what a complete ass that I was and that, you know, all of this hatred and blame and anger that I'm putting on this other guy, like, yeah. you know, like that's, that's you, like, figure, yeah. figure your shit out. Like, it's like, yeah. you know, you didn't know enough. You didn't do enough due diligence. You didn't know what the hell you were doing. Like, how can you, and finally at the end of the three days, it's like, well, then now what are you going to quit? Like, what are you going to do to turn this into a positive? Like, do you just want to work at the bank the rest of your life? Or are you going to lose that job if they check your credit? So good luck to you. Like right. do something, you know, S shut up and do something there. There it was again. Yep. Right there it was again. So uh, I, I remember to make it into a positive, all I could do was, well, I remembered one strategy that if I had no cash and no credit and I, you know, but I had a drive, like what is the one thing I could do to try and still replace my income from the bank? And that was wholesaling. So I yeah. spent as much uh, effort as I could, as much time as I could relearning the game of marketing. Uh, and, and the hardest thing, man, was to take that phone back out.
the hardest thing I ever did was to pull that phone back out and hit the power button. And uh, I expected it. Like I literally felt the vibrations for like months after that of it going off, you know, it was just, it was terrible. But um, that taught me all my rules. I mean, I, I couldn't afford to lose money anymore. I had no money to lose. So I literally had to, you know, with a couple of some close networking friends that I met at local groups, what are my rules of engagement? What are my rules for buying? What am I looking for? You're a three, I have a triple decker buyer here in the Somerville, Cambridge, Boston market. Okay, what are you looking for? I'm going to look for what you're looking for. I'm going to knock on doors. I'm going to make some phone calls. And do I, can I get five grand if I flip you a contract? All right, you're my new guy. What, you know, what I heard you say in there, and I think I think I want our listeners to really hear this part is that you were down and out, you felt beat up, you felt like you were like, what am I going to do? And you had a moment of clarity. In that moment of clarity, you took responsibility. I was just thinking the exact same right? word you took, and and that's what I think. We you know we live in a society that likes to blame because you know it doesn't feel good to feel that way about yourself or to know that that you're the one with the flaws and that you're the one that made those choices. And I think that that's something I can really admire about you is you took personal responsibility in that moment. And then you took action to get to get out of that. Right. And that that is huge. It's, the, it's, the, it's putting those two together. It's, it's I don't think you can take, you know, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, Nick, but I don't think you can take action until you accept responsibility for the first failure. Because we have, I look at everything in my company, whatever happens, no matter how, if, even if I didn't have a lot to do with it personally, I'm like, I hired that person, yeah. so it's my, you know, I did it, right? I it's saw, up to me. I saw a quote from that. Anthony Robbins this morning on Facebook that was talking about, you know, have fun in life, do what you want, you know, make mistakes because you're going to learn from those and, and you know, nobody's perfect. We can be the best human beings we can be, but nobody's perfect. So, you know, learn to enjoy the mistakes. Not that they're all fun to go through, but if you can like take that lesson and, and learn from it and make your life better from it, then do that. Yeah. There's always a nugget. And if you don't go through the mistakes, we call it, we, there's a syndrome around here, right? They, we've had people that come out and do their first deal and they make $150,000. We call that home run syndrome. Right. Like yeah. they're, they're a walking time bomb because yeah, everything you are. Yeah. 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 So it, it takes what it takes us, what you went through, what we went through. Like it takes that grit to really get it. And now we're going into another, I feel we're going into another down market. Yeah. So what I've been through one down market. I got hurt really, really bad, but I also realize now how much uh, opportunity and money was made by the people who had already gone through their down markets and had their challenges in the last down market. So now I am going into this one prepared. Like that's just how it's going to be. Yeah. So. Now, now, you, now, you know, now you've taken that life experience and said, okay, I've gotten beat up. I know what it feels like. And I think that's true as, as you're successful when you're, when you're building, you know, we're building businesses, but we're also building our lives. And part of building our lives is going through the hard times and, you know, and learning, like Amber said, learning from them and saying, what can I do next time to avoid this? Or like you said, looking at other people, you know, Nick, you said, I, I look at other people's mistakes and say, look, at th this is what they have, but this is where they came from. That's what we try and do on our show is let our listeners know, hey, listen, it, it takes getting beat up sometimes. Now, I don't want to scare anybody off from going for their dreams because they hear our stories and go, oh, my God. I, so so let me just file <laughs> bankruptcy right now. <laughs> you know, let me let me get it out of the way. But they don't. You don't have to go through getting beat up that bad. Well, I think especially if you can learn from other people's mistakes. Yeah. Do that through coaching. But Nick, you brought up an interesting point about you know right now we are in the pandemic. You know, COVID is going on. So you bring up that our market is about to change. So being that you've had experience of going through those down markets and losing money and not doing well, but then recovering from that, what would you <clears> tell you know? someone that's brand new that wants to get into it that recognizes that this is going to be a good time for it or somebody that's you know maybe got a few deals under their belt and wants to kind of take advantage of, of what's going to happen in the market today well would i tell them is that what you said what would you tell them yeah what advice oh, would you give them? uh well get a coach but just wait no just kidding i'm I, <laughs> <laughs> um I, I i do feel so around here in the Boston area i think we all know that the market's coming to an absolute peak when there's everyone and their brothers and sisters around us on the radio, you know, promoting their new coaching programs. And that's normal. Like, right. Like yeah. there's good coaches, local coaches like you two, local coaches like us, right. There's people that we want to align themselves with, but the national people, as soon as you start hearing the radio ads of the national groups coming around the town, you know, that we're approaching a peak of the real estate market. And that's technically one of the worst times to get in as a real estate flipper. Now it's never a bad time to come in and learn how to market, learn how to negotiate, deals learn how to pick up that phone and, and and make those calls learn how to you know construction manage that's never a bad time so i think that the, when's the best when's when, when what do they say when is the next best time to start and that would be now yeah. right 
So I, I, I firmly suggest people get their feet wet, but only if they have someone local that can help steer them through those challenges. You don't have to go through bankruptcies. You don't have to go through a foreclosure. You know, so like. Let me your challenge your thought on something because Amber's, Amber's in our story is unique. We actually didn't start investing until 2000. We bought our first house in 07 and lost it. Not, no, we didn't lose it. We flipped it in 08. Yeah. So right when the market crashed. So we built our empire through that time. So now I know what it's like to build in a hard time. And then it's certainly like now it, it flows a little bit differently. Right. But I, but I'm, li we're living proof that so many people drop off. So many investors drop off that you can start during that time if you know what you're doing, right? If you know what you're doing, you have yeah. help. And you know, it's funny, our coaching business was kind of a localized business. And we were in several different cities. We were, we were around in Hartford and Albany and we were in Rochester, we were in Atlanta last year and that was going well. Now we're doing a virtual home flea workshop and that all of a sudden is impacting people nationally, but they get the local feel because they work with us directly. So it's yeah, not like a guru that doesn't know, they're just there to speak. Right. We live it every day. So it's a very, this pandemic's allowed us to really expand our business and help a lot of people that we didn't think we would normally meet. And Nick, I think to your point though, is that you can be local in that if you're still giving people the personal touch, no matter where they are. But if you're just like hiring hired guns out there that are good speakers and salespeople, yeah. that's, you, you lose that connection. But if you stay you connected, you're like really actively involved in your business and helping your students and, you know, taking that real one-on-one -on -one approach, that's the, the people who don't do a deal that I'm angry with the people who stopped doing real estate 20 years ago and are on stage coaching like they know what's oh, going yeah. on in the business today. Jive, <laughs> we we so, before we dive more into that, Nick, tell people I don't we got more to talk about, but tell people how they can find you and locate you and all that kind of stuff. Do some self promotion here. Oh, sure. No, that's fine. Um, if anyone's curious about the whole story, I kind of went through 90% of it, but I wrote a story. Uh, I'm a bestseller on Amazon with a couple of other awesome co-authors. It's called Don't Quit, Stories of Persistence, Courage, and Faith. Uh, Kyle Wilson was our publisher. He was awesome. But it's a whole group of stories, uh, motivational and, and, and you know self-help stories of people who went through the shit and it came back to the other side. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pump in this too, is uh, 2010, because now I had all my shit figured out in the single family world, right? Just fast forward four years and I'm like, I'm the man. Went in a multifamily for a while and syndicated and I followed a national guru that one thought was doing syndications. And that was my second heart reset where I invested in his deals and lost another 400 grand. So <laughs> we won't talk about that today though. That's our episode. It just seems to be the number for you, 400 yeah, grand. You that's, like, the, you know, that's, that's, your, that's your unlucky number. Yeah. So, so we've, we've talked about some hardships. Give people a silver lining though, like, like Oh well, God, yeah. Some success. Yeah, for sure. You and you, yeah. yeah. You, I, mean, you, I think every time you go to a different level, you're going to make mistakes, right? You're going to take hits. You're going to make, but sometimes when you're first starting out, if you lose 50 grand, you think that's the end of the world. Or like when you first started out, you had lost almost 20 grand in, in coaching things that didn't work for you. Now you never really lost them because someplace deep inside you kept pushing, you had a little knowledge, right? So you, you eventually picked it up. But it seems like we always, when you want to go to the next level in life, you're going to take some hits getting there, you know, unless you can, uh, even, even with a great coach, you're going to take some of your own hits. Hopefully they're not as, hopefully not 400 grand, right? So hopefully you can get to the next level and, and move up to them, but tell people about your success. I, I obviously have a lot of success. So let's hear about that. Sure. Absolutely. So again, with everything I just went through in Minnesota, right? It, it literally taught me the game uh, that I, I, it, I, I can't afford to lose any more money. So what are my rules of engagement? What are my buying criteria? What am I supposed to be doing every day? And that ultimately was the foundation of how, you know, we started the uh, wholesaling business and the fix and flip business. I wasn't financeable until about 2013 because of that issue and to, that all hit my credit in 06. Yeah. But because of that, um, you know, I was, I became dangerous. I, a network of hard money lenders, a network of private lenders. Uh, I didn't know much about the hard money or private money game, but so it kind of forced me into that world and it forced me into being resourceful. Uh, you know, do, do I work with partners? Do I, I now know how to deal with sellers and set up a marketing engine and then set up a team and then set up the direct mail and the phone calls and the check. So that taught me everything about the single family fix and flip or the wholesale game. And then as we moved into, as you just heard, my multifamily reset button, um, most of that is after you realize it, I was very fast this time to say, whose fault is this? It's no one else's but mine. And what do I learn from it? Right. I, I, I just had to look at down deep. I could I've sulked for maybe like two months and I'm like, all right, this is 
This is still me. What do I learn from this? And that became, all right, well, I didn't really know the operations that well. And I was relying on other people, like other general partners to handle operations. And clearly they were not qualified. I didn't know what they were doing. So how can I get out of that? Well, control issues did set in a little bit. I'm like, I need to know operations. I need to know how to literally, if every, if all the shit's a fan and I have to go to a property that's hundred doors and fire a management company, what do I do to turn that place around? And that born our uh, property management company, you know? So it's like literally like becoming the better operator every single step of the way, mitigating the losses that we've taken. And if I didn't have those losses, no chance uh, could we, you know, sit here and do over, you know, 75 deals a year? Could we have, you know, at some point over 220 doors? There's just no chance. And the systems wouldn't be built. And I'd be my solopreneur, maybe making more money because now I have a lot of overhead. But I could say so we never know. It's a, it, yeah. we, we all think that sometimes, right? We never know what's, what's better, right? <laughs> Staying small or getting big, right? It's all, it's got pros and cons for sure. Do you find that you're, you know, I know that I have, but I wonder if our listeners hearing this, you know, when you start going through challenges and then coming back, so you, you accept the responsibility of the second, you know, second failure, the third failure, and, and we're going to have more, right? As we get bigger, we're always going to have things that go through. Do you find that your sulk time, you mentioned the word sulk, is your sulk time shortening as you get, as you get more experience taking the hits? Thousand percent agree. I think that's the progress, right? That's our mind progress right there. Uh, you know, it, it, how quickly can we get back on the horse? How quickly can we take the lesson, take the golden nugget and move forward? You know, so it's not, yeah. you see, you obviously you see Rocky, you know, that one famous quote he has, it's not about, it's not about getting hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and get back up. And I think that as we get experienced, older is maybe, you know, just getting older doesn't mean that you're any better, but get, as you, as we get wiser and more experienced in life, we always get people like us always get back up just no matter how fast we get back up. And now I try and get my get backs up to hours or minutes instead of days. And I still have times where I'm down for a day or week and I'm like, never be like, you know, you're kind of being a crabby idiot. You know, I'm like, what am I, am I being negative? Because I'll, I'll be getting pissy about something. And I real I have to sit back and say to myself, you know, I'm so glad we had this today. Cause I, even you, even having this call with you today reminds me to accept responsibility because we're in a world right now that's out of control. I mean, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. I don't, you're, it's out of control. It's out of control and things are, are crazy. And the only thing we can control is how we react to it. And just what you said before, you know, we've had to, we've had to pivot all of our businesses, our speaking business. We had a big, huge uh, event ready to go. And two weeks from there, they pulled the plug and we were done and we had to pivot. And now we're doing virtual and all of a sudden our business has gone national overnight. And we have an event coming up that we're, almost, we're like, way above capacity we're trying to figure out how to handle all the people coming in and it's it you know that never would have happened had something bad not happened to us we lost eighty thousand dollars in that one you know when they pulled the plug it was like well there went 80 grand in marketing they, they don't hurts. give refunds on tv and radio you know no, we, commercials. we yeah we we do the infomercial a lot of people sign up for us they, they're like oh i saw your infomercial i love you guys you're real i love you so all of a sudden we lost all that money and we had to pivot and just like just like you you if you don't pivot, you're gonna die. We've had to, we've all had to pivot hard. I mean, I don't know about you guys in Boston, but up here in New York, we've had to pivot like a mother. I, mean, <laughs> I also I also think that yeah. that being an entrepreneur also does require a level of, um, you know, the mental aspect is huge, obviously, but it it also requires a level of emotional maturity because there's people that make mistakes. And you know, either stay there and sulk and wallow in them, or or they, you know, maybe they do get back up, but they keep make, making the same mistake over and over and over again. I think it's really important that you have to learn from your mistake and then make changes, because you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting the same, re you know, different results. Right. So so it's you know making those mistakes, trying to minimize the mistakes first of all, and you can do that through coaching and education, because you know mm -hmm. other people have already made them. There's no reason you have to keep making you know making the same yes. mistake people have you know have a track to run on instead of building the track yourself and those golden nuggets that you come up you come up with after making the mistakes since the mistakes will still be made even with a coach like you mentioned right like yeah. i like to now even protect me from myself so I, I will come up with that golden nugget and i'll write it down but i always wrote one down and that helped a little bit but then i'm like all right 
I wrote it down. It only helps me if I read it and I remember it. And I, I usually you remember pain, so you can remember the pain. Right. But um, I will now take that nugget and actually try to like instill it into our systems and processes, right? Like, so how can this apply in what we do as a company? And I will literally take our SOPs, our standard operating procedures, and like make a new rule or make a new something to make, all right, that's this was born out of blood, sweat, and tears. Let's right. move this in this role, you know? I think that I, I have a good suggestion for you that I think would work. When you have one of those nuggets you write down, tape it to your shampoo bottle. <laughs> that way you'll see it every time. I don't know if he had the shampoo bottle. bottle. I don't know if it's shampoo bottle. I'm sorry. That wasn't a ball joke. That was just a, you know. I, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's the shaving cream bottle. I mean, you're seeing it every day, you know, but but I keep going back to that. So tell everybody what you, you know, how how do you on a daily basis, you know, we're the it's the real estate of mind show. How do you keep yourself mentally strong? You share some things, but. How does Nick every day battle through, you know, I always, you know, I, I grew up in the 80s and there's a, there's a famous song from uh, Megadeth and in, the, in there it says, you know, it, there's, a, there's a war inside my head. If I take a day off, I'll be dead. And that's that line plays in my head because some days I'm like, damn, I got a war going on here, baby. And yeah, so and then he gets the one and, eyebrow look. We, we've, we've, <laughs> all got, we've all got those wars, though. I know you do because I, I just know you without even knowing you. I know you. How do you? deal with that war inside your head every day what is what do you do what's nick do what an awesome question glenn um i now have a very so i've always had routines that i've been very strict with but i've also i mean another personal battle where i've, I've been through two divorces um and it's been really really hard and i have two amazing kids and now i'm a single dad so i think for me i try to do i still have a very strict regimen in, in the morning but i have to, i've always struggled with finding out when I'm supposed to do things, especially when I, I have the kids. So I, um, all every single morning, I will uh, attempt to do a little bit of journaling. It doesn't have to be a, an official journal, but uh, you know, three things I'm grateful for. What are my three priorities for the day? What are my three wins for the day? And um, I'll either sometimes meditate or not, depending on how I'm feeling. I'm not really, I'm trying to get into that, but I know that's it's a way to, but I clear my head in different ways, right? Yep. So uh, I'll do the, and the app I use, which is a very fast app, it's called Five Minute Journal. It's a free app. Um, and I use that every single morning, which helps clear my head. I will always do it like a 20 minute bout of fitness. If I can do a 20 minute workout, great. If I can only do, you know, I have to do 60 to 100 push ups to make myself feel like I'm sweating, I'll do that if I'm running late to something. Um, but those two things, along with reaching out to a couple um, of family and friends, uh, it's a two. It, the actual process is called Core Four. I have a mentor and a coach. You guys heard of it? It's 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 a warrior program. Funny you mentioned that, Glenn. It's called Wake Up Warrior Program. Okay. Um, I'm I'm 100%. I used to do something similar, and now I'm rigidly a part of that program. And I have coaches and mentors in that program right now, which is helping okay. me really get the certainty down. So yeah. it's been great. It's uh, been that's awesome. So. So last question, one of the last questions I want to ask you is that you are a single dad and we have four kids and I'm all about being a dad. And I know we've both been through divorces, though. We've both been through divorces. Yep. So we know we share all that pain. So we know how all that goes. So how do you find, you know, I got a couple of questions. One is that our, this is more of a statement. I find that my kids don't listen to what I tell them. They do what I do. And mm. even, even watching them repeat things that we say in our house, we say, we don't allow them to say, I can't. It's always, how can I? We just, we reframe that. And so even the little things we do like that, they, they hear us doing it and they're, they're there. Even when we exercise in our house, if we're exercising, now our kids all exercise because they kind of see us doing it. Your kids are seeing you journal and get in battle through things. And I wonder, how old are your kids? Uh, six and four. Yep, six and four. So we're. We have a five and a seven and a 15 and a 20. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I have a and I have a 33 and a grandkid in the way. So a lot, it's a very confusing life, but a lot of stuff going on in my world. But, <laughs> but I guess, I guess my question is, you know, what do you do to find that balance, that family as entrepreneurs, we're crazy and we're working. Our brains are always on. We're always on. How do you find time to be the best dad you can be in the middle of going for your dreams and your goals in real estate? Oh, wow. Another amazing question. Um, I, uh, I have been forced to be very intentional with 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 my kids so if i say everything you just said is is exactly what i try to do like it, you know there's no such word as can't in our house either um every morning we start with a little mantra you know we put our hands in the middle and we say we lead we respect we improve and we give and then at night we rehearse that okay so what did we do to lead today what did we do to give today what did we do to respect today um but on the actual experiences i'm trying to teach my six and four year old which isn't going well that experiences and memories are more important than things right oh, yeah. 
Um, yes. It's, it's difficult, uh, especially when, you know, uh, their mom might be getting them great four wheelers and this and that. And it's, yeah. I'm, I'm more like, what, you know, what, what, where do you want to go? Like they're six and four, so they don't know a lot yet, but it's like, I want to take you here. Let's do this cooking class. Let's do this, you know, bowling day out. Let's do this. And I'm trying, because we're entrepreneurs and we're crazy, I have to calendar that just like I would a business appointment. Like it has to go right in there two or three weeks in advance. I know exactly what I'm doing with them every single week. And um, I have their birthdays planned out over their birthday experiences planned out until they're 21 and 20. So it's like, <laughs> I have yeah. to plan to protect me for myself. I think the big world's intentional there. You're, you're, you're being intentional about being a great dad. And I think that's, you gotta go ahead and, yeah, you be, have to do that be you intentional do it, and be forget. present so like you know we get so addicted to our phones and you know there's a text that comes in or you know whatever and you know there's so often we can be standing there with our phone and our kids like trying to talk to us saying mama dada whatever and like we don't even hear them because we're so on our phones so like that's one thing that we really try to do is put our phone down like and look them in the eye when we're talking to them and i will actually make comments about you know what you're you're more important than my phone right now and then i'll see them do the same thing sometimes they'll be like you know i'll tell them people are more important than screens so they'll they'll put down their ipads even if they're you know like into something and they're like all right people are more important than the ipad you know or, or they'll remind us when or, we're yeah. not listening because god you know we're saying it like we have it mastered no. yeah we have it mastered we yeah. always put our phone down shit i wish right because i'm always even i'll be doing <laughs> something and amber will go honey Cruz has called your name twice i'm like huh because they call your name so much and i look up I'm like oh, and i realize like dad fail no way i pick back up I'm like you know and i you know but i think that it reminds us to do that and then our kids are, are you know our kids are going to do what we do right so we teach them how, how to respect all that kind of stuff so exactly i, I like your little that's mantra cool. though that's very cool yeah it's very good i think you gotta, be, you gotta be so intentional because at the end of the day we can build these massive real estate empires which is wonderful but if we get there and we have nothing but a wake of destruction in the background we have our relationships are all broken with our family and our kids and our anybody close to us we don't have any friends and the only friends we have are all people in our industry that work for us that's not really a life in my opinion thousand percent agree and it, if only more people would get that right and it took me two divorces to learn that honestly i mean yeah i hopefully it doesn't take some people time to learn that but it's i now learn kids are for me number one right and i i at this point will sacrifice even a big business deal i, I don't want to but i will sacrifice a big business deal if i you know if i have to if my kids need me period and it's hard it's hard to balance but it's it's like that that four we call it the core four in the morning right um uh fitness family and friends, um, you know, uh, finding and exploring in your business um, and, uh, and, and connecting, uh, you know, it's, 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 you gotta just make sure we hit all of those things every single morning uh, before we get the door. Oh, great. Well, listen, this has been awesome, Nick. I appreciate you being with us today. Tell everybody again, one last time, how they can find you, how they can connect with you, follow you, all that good stuff. Sure. Thank you, guys. That's Glenn and Amber. Um, you guys can, can you all find me on, I'm on Facebook. I'm an old school guy. I still have a Facebook account. I uh, also have an Instagram account because I'm trying to be new. Yeah. New and improved. I uh, don't have TikTok yet. Don't I'm not getting into TikTok yet. Um, uh, LinkedIn, but Facebook is probably the best way to, uh, you know, link up with me, check the, check us out and you can check us out what we're doing at aarealestategroup.com, greater Boston area. So. Hey, realestategroup.com. Awesome. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, Nick, this has been great. I really appreciate you sharing your your failures, how you've beat through them, how you've got Kevin on top, how you're being intentional as a father. That stuff's all very inspirational. Yeah, just, I think our listeners are going to love it. the openness of it. You know, I think so many people just kind of like scratch the surface of stuff and I, we appreciate you being so open. Totally. All right. Thank you for this podcast specifically. I mean, you don't need me to say it because everybody already hears it. This is what people need to hear. So thank you for doing that. Too many people are going into just a strategy after strategy after strategy after strategy, right? And that's there's a there's a piece for that. But if they don't hear this, they'll just stop and quit immediately. Or if they don't hear this, they're going to value a real estate deal over spending time with their wife and kids. So yeah. thank you for doing what you do and bringing this to light. This is a brilliant, brilliant podcast. Awesome. And thank you for telling our students to just shut up and do it. <laughs> yes. I love it. I love it. All right, Nick. <laughs> thanks a lot. Make sure you like and subscribe and leave us a review. And leave us your questions and comments and we will personally answer. And please share it to anyone you think could benefit. You can find us all over social media at Glenn and Amber Schwarm. We'll see you next week.